Tonight's uh, presentation is going to be on the uh, Spanish American War. Actually, uniforms and equipment of the United States Army during the Spanish American War. Uh, I'll introduce <coughs> the questions about it. Maybe, maybe stuff that I'll cover afterwards. But um, like I said, there's a lot to cover here, so I'll hopefully I can get through this all smoothly. Um, before I before I get to the equipment here, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the Spanish American War. Um, it probably, I would say it ranks amongst what we would call some of those forgotten wars. Um, a lot of, you know, once, once the veterans or the people that, that whose lives are touched are gone, you don't really, you know, you don't really hear much about it. It's not really like World War II. We're still going about World War II in Korea, of course, but not. But, um, you know, as time progresses on, uh, the people that keep the memories of these things alive, once they're gone, and you know, those of us are scholars, students in history, and you're interested in really don't do much research on them. But um, for that era of people that were born in the 1880s through the early turn of the century, this was, this was a, an important event in their, in their lives. Um, also, I, I got involved with the military club and actually got involved first with the Spanish American War around the same time Civil War. But the uh, Spanish American War was something that always is interesting to me for some, for some unknown reason. I don't know exactly why. But, uh, I, I would probably lend it to the fact that it, it's kind of a, uh, it's a transitional period in the United States military history. Um, it's right there on the, it's right there on the cusp of us starting to get it moving away from the remnants of the, the Civil War and the Indian Wars and into more modern warfare, such as we get into the World War I. So the Spanish American War is kind of a transitional period, especially with uniforms and equipment and all. Um, it, it's also, um, it, it's a difficult time frame to collect, if you want to start collecting, because uh, uh, a lot of this stuff is just not really out there anymore. Um, Weapons, yes, when we get into the accoutrements and uniforms and equipment, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult if you want to start to piece together a collection. Also, when I collect, I don't collect anything that's not government issue. If it's not government issue, I don't have an interest in it. When you get to the Spanish American War, the government was at this point where they weren't really giving them that guy guys a lot. Yeah, other than your, your uniform and your clothing, uh, any items, other, other items that you needed, a lot of stuff was private purchase, and I'm not into the private purchase stuff. Um, but it's it's an interesting time frame. As we go through this, I'll, I'll cover the stuff that probably most of what prefer to get right, right to the meat and potatoes of weapons. But the, the uniforms and equipment is what's interesting. Now, what you need to understand about the United States Army, or, or during this 1890s period, is that the United States government, your know, right the Army, the United States regular army, only numbered about 28,000 men. That was the entire United States Army. About 26,000 enlisted men and non-commissioned officers, and about another 2,000 officers. So, altogether, the regular army consisted of about 28,000 and some odd men. They were stationed in about 70 to 75 outposts throughout the United States. The main purpose of the army in those days was really a police force. It was to keep in check and to suppress the few uprisings from whatever hostile Indian tribes were still floating around. And really, as basically the break up of strikes and problems with organized labor is what the army was doing. 28,000 men. I'm quite sure there's probably more people living right here in uh, um, Cattleworth than there was in the United States Army at the time. And think about this, they're spread out from the East Coast to the West Coast, from the Gulf of Mexico to the Canadian border. Most of these men had never seen any real combat. The only officers that saw any real combat would have been your veteran officers from the Civil War. These men would have been in their 50s at this point. I didn't like that there was too many enlisted men that were still in the Army, regular Army, that were Civil War vets. But some of your senior officers, such as um, um, uh, uh, Fitzhugh Lee, General Lee's uh, nephew, uh, Joe Wheeler, some of these men were still around. These were, see, these were young Civil War soldiers. They were uh, officers by the time of the Spanish War. Okay, they were in the 50s. Joe Schaff, some of your senior members in the United States Army, they were Civil War veterans. The, the regular Army 
The posts were very small. Most of these men never saw uh, a group of men larger on a regimental size. So divisions and multiple regiments together was not, was not seen. Uh, most of these officers did not know how to handle large groups of men like that. Because remember, the United States was kind of like an isolationistic type. We were, our army was really a police force or a peacekeeping force for the country. We didn't like Great Britain, Germany, France, uh, Spain have acquisitions outside of the United States. We did not have colonists. Their armies were pretty well proven and tested. Their equipment was, you know, was tried in the field and, and updated. Their armies were pretty well set. These men, you know, they had functioning armies, especially Great Britain. They had colonies all over. Same with Spain, and Germany, and like said, France, all these places all had colonies. So their armies were constantly functioning. They were constantly new recruits coming in and out. The United States Army at the time really was, uh, you know, if you were in the Army back in the 1890s, people didn't really think very highly of the United States. Uh, usually there were, were shirkers, criminals, drunkards and things like that that say were in the army. So you know, the army of the United States was, was really a place for some of they were not very motivated to go into, unlike some of the other countries. So the United States, when, when the war was declared, we're going to talk a little bit about that just briefly. Um, most European countries did not really put the United States as a winning force in this conflict. Even though Spain was in a pretty well steady decline, its empire was declining. It was nearly at the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. They didn't think that the American army was going to fare very well against the well-trained Spanish army. Um, Spain, uh, Spain's acquisitions stretched all over the Caribbean, and in the United States, had none. Uh, our army, we were still considered at that point in time an agricultural experiment. There wasn't a lot of, you know, there was not a lot of people that had uh, uh, a lot of faith in the United States Army. As, as President McKinley once stated that uh, God, God protects drugs in the United States Army. But we kind of fumbled through the Spanish-American War. Um, the other thing, our Navy. Our Navy was just coming into its own. Uh, by the 1890s, they had just started replacing the wooden fleet with steel-protected and steel-hulled cruisers. Our Navy in the 1880s and early early 1900s was a joke. When when the Navy was out in uh, ports of call at, at, at locations around the world, people came out to see the ships because they were more of a relic and a curiosity than anything else. So the United States Navy was just just coming out, was just was just coming into its own. And at the time of the Spanish American War, the United States Navy was not all that large either, and our Navy was not really considered anything really formidable. Um, with the loss of Battleship Maine, <clears throat> one of its two second-class battleships, the um, majority of the Navy was made up of, of, of protected, uh, steel protected and protected cruisers, some what we would call a destroyer-class ships, um, and a couple of battleships. Now, mind you, in the 1890s, battleships do not compare them to the post-Dreadnought ships, even the World War I. They were, they, were, they were much smaller. Ships like the Oregon, the Kearsarge, the Massachusetts, they were they were they were ocean-going steel-hulled battleships, but don't compare them to anything that uh, we would call modern. But the United States was was trying to make a was was trying to make a make itself a, a world power. And <clears throat> Cuba, being off the coast of Florida, uh, was referred to as the Pearl of the West Indies. Now, as early as the 1820s, the United States had had interests in Cuba. In fact, they made an attempt, I'm not sure the president, uh, made an attempt to purchase Cuba. And Spain's answer was they would rather see it sink into the ocean than sell it to the United States. So in the 1820s, there was interest in Cuba. Um, of course, that was the era of the Manifest Destiny, and we were trying to, you know, we were trying to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak. Uh, but nothing really was done after that. And Cuba just remained off the coast along with Puerto Rico. And if you really think about it, look at the, the Caribbean area. You know, the United States was surrounded by a lot of small islands and archipelagos that were owned by other nations other than the United States. Uh, but Spain, as I said, by the 1890s, was pretty much getting near the bottom of the barrel of its, of its, its empire. 
uh, the, I believe the emperor or the king, King of Spain, was a young 12 or 13 year old boy at the time. The father was shy. So he was, um, I think he and his mother were ruling in the state. You know a little more about that part of history. I think he was a very young boy. He was the, the emperor, what, he was 12 or 13? Oh my God, yeah, yeah he had regions. In other words, adults that ruled before him. So Spain, Spain was in trouble. Uh, the, what had happened through the 1890s and early 1880s is that American interests, the businesses, had moved into the Philippines, had moved into Cuba and Puerto Rico. And American business interests had left, like they're doing now, and they'd gone into they'd gone into these Caribbean islands and places where there was a lot of a lot of money to be made with sugar cane, sandwiches, molasses. Wrong. And also, they view the Philippines as a potential uh, center for the Oriental trade. Now, as we know with all wars, there's usually two sides to them. There's the humanitarian side, and there's also the underlying what's in it for us side. And the little guy like us, the guys that go out and do the fight, we're always usually told about the humanitarian side of why we should go do this. Of course, the big business in other places, they have, they're looking to make money. And pretty much the Spanish-American War was a combination of both. Uh, American interests by the 1890s were, were in trouble then because of a number of revolutions, or I would say uprisings, starting in the 1850s, uh, of the Cuban people trying to break away from Spanish rule. By 1895, the, the last and the bloodiest the most known of these revolutions started to take place. And this is where if you've done any research in historical, you, you've read them, some things, uh, Spain had a pretty heavy hand with its acquisitions and its, and its islands like this. And um, American interests were over there. And what was happening was, is for when I gather and stand in the European history, if I, I don't explain this right, please jump in. Um, because of the, 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 the American negativity towards how Spain was treating the people, and they, they knew the American government was not really happy about this, a lot of the American businesses and interests were being basically harassed. And money, you know, it's all about the, the, the almighty dollar and getting hit in the pocket. Uh, a lot of these, interests, these businesses were fearing of retribution from the Spanish government. You know, while in Rome, was the Rome. They were, they, were in, they were in Spanish property, so there wasn't much the United States government could do for them. You have to play by rules. But they were being harassed or singled out by the Spanish. There wasn't really a lot they could have done. Um, in Cuba, the heavy hand, the way that the, 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 the Cubans were being treated was reaching the American shores. Now, America's always been sympathetic to the plight of anybody who's being oppressed. It goes back to the American Revolution. Um, and in, in Cuba, uh, the, the, at that time, it was the, um, the I guess we call him the person who, what's the name for the person that would be in charge? He was, uh, it, well, from Spain, he'd be not, not the, I guess like the governor, uh -huh. governor general, whatever. He was uh, uh, Valerio Weller was his name. And he was quite a quite cruel individual. And he started setting up uh, concentration, what we call concentration camps. Well, the people put in there with concentrados. Anybody gave was a political political problem, person like that, they stuck them in these concentration camps. And these things got back to the Americans along with you know atrocities that were being committed against children and women. And this was just stirring up the American you know, the American people here. Uh, about you gotta go in and do something about this. Now McKinley, being a Civil War veteran, was not much for getting the United States involved in war. And he once said he had seen, he'd seen the dead pile like cordwood on the battlefield, and he never wanted to be involved with that again. But little by little, such people as Hearst and Pulitzer and a lot of the people that had a lot of power in the United States, who were looking at this more as an economic angle than more of a humanitarian angle, kept pushing and pushing and pushing and rallying up the American people about how we have to go in and help our, these poor people over in Cuba. Well, by December of 1897, it got to the point where uh, the president was back into a corner and felt obligated to do something. So, from the North Atlantic Squadron, he dispatched a warship to go to Cuba. Now, it was not unheard of in those days for warships 
from other nations to make a port of call. Ships had to come in for repairs, for recoaling, and things like this. So it was not uncommon. So although, you know, with everything going on, some people would consider it almost an act of war, or it wasn't, but it was. They dispatched the United States warship <coughs> USS Maine from the Atlantic Squadron, which it was the flagship of, to go into Cuba as, as a courtesy call. Really what they were there to do was to show the American presence, show the American people that were there, the industry that show the flag, and flex a little muscle. Now the ship was there for quite some time. It was there from the end of December, I'm not quite sure when it pulled into the harbor, and all the way through into February. On the eve before the ship was the eve before the ship was going to leave, February 16th, it was weighing anchor and it was going to New Orleans. On the night of February 15th, a mysterious explosion sunk the ship in the harbor with the loss of all but about 64 members of the crew. Until Pearl Harbor, that was the single greatest loss of life that the United States Navy ever sustained. And with that, and with everything else that was going on, McKinley and Congress, they moved for declaration of war. They already made their mind up that the Spanish were somehow involved, Spanish treachery were somehow involved with the sinking of the ship. And to date, uh, there's really no answers to this. There's, 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 if you really look at it, the, 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 unwisely, it would have Spain would have done this. It would not have watched the Spain's part to sink the ship. So uh, they were trying to avoid war. In fact, uh, at this point in time, uh, Spain and the United States, they were, they were trying to work things out. But by the time the battleship Maine sank, that was the end of that. And fever just ran through the United States. And cries of war came. And by April of 1898, the United States, actually Spain declared war on the United States first. And then the United States declared war on Spain, but retroactively dated it to like the 21st of April, I believe. So we were off and running. But there was one little problem. The United States Army was not really equipped to go to war. As I said, 28,000 men, and the National Guard consisted of about 125,000 uh, National Guardsmen across the United States. At that time, the National Guardsmen, like they are now, were in the jurisdiction of the governors. They were not supplied and equipped by the United States government army. They were supplied by the state. So the, there was a lot of variations in quality of men, equipment, training. So the guards, some guards were better off than others. Some of them were illy, illy equipped and trained. Others were better equipped and trained. The army was going to be what it was. The majority, and another thing too, the, by that time in the 1890s, a lot of there was the 24th and 25th infantry regiments were all, which were all African American, and a 9th and 10th cavalry for the Buffalo soldiers. A lot, a lot of, a lot of the crack, a lot of the good troops that the United States Army had at the time were African Americans. Um, but a 28,000 man army uh, was not going to cut invading Cuba. Now they also, not only did they have to invade Cuba, they were going to take on going into Puerto Rico and also the Philippines. And the Spanish-American War, although the battle, the, the conflict with Spain only lasted about 10 weeks, the war dragged on a total of four years because after the treaty with Spain, any hostilities with the Spanish, an insurrection erupted in the Philippines. And usually it, they, they, they kind of grouped the whole thing together, Spanish-American and Filipino War. Um, Although we annexed, we not, I want to use the word annexed, we, we, we liberated Cuba and set them up as their own government, their own country. We did not do that for Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. And what happened there was, not so much in Guam and Puerto Rico, but in the Philippines, the Filipinos looked at the Americans as nothing more than replacing Spanish rule. They want to know why. We, they figured that we were going to do the same for them that we did for the Cubans, we did. Uh, and that erupted into the insurrection, which lasted until 1902. And sporadically, all the way up to the early stages, almost before World War II, there were still uprisings. Not only did we have to contend with uh, Spanish soldiers that were like freedom fighters that were still running around the islands in the Philippines, we had to deal with the Filipinos 
And then we had to deal with another group of people on the island of Mindanao, which were basically Muslims. So it, it, it became it became a it became an all out uh, an all out conflict, which cost the Americans thousands of lives. And I, I have to dig it up later in the book. I, um, Stan, unless you write somewhere, I believe that the Philippine insurrection has the highest percent of loss of soldiers per men engaged in any conflict that we've had based on what was there. I think it's 5.5 percent battle deaths or something like that. The, the problem is, the, the, theoretically, on July 4th, I think 1902, Roosevelt declared the you know, mission accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> the fighting didn't stop in 1913. Yeah, kept going. Kept going. <laughs> and, and, no, mission accomplished. Yeah. And Falling. also, the, 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 the problem with, with, the, with the Philippine insurrection was that it turned into a guerrilla warfare. It was, it was reminiscent of seven years later in, the, in, in Vietnam. They, they abandoned after the first year of regular organized fighting, and the Philippines just turned into a guerrilla battleground. Uh, yellow fever, malaria, the men were riddled with sicknesses and disease. And what turned out is a great, what turned out as a, you know, a great humanitarian act. And the American soldiers started off uh, being, you know, being basically, I wouldn't say idolized, but, you know, appreciated. Here in the United States, they got villainized towards the end. Towards the end of the, the, the insurrection, most, most Americans wanted the troops out of the Philippines. And those returning troops were not greeted very warmly when they returned because a lot of negative press, a lot of things came out about the troops and again it started about atrocities being committed by American troops while they were over there. So we started off being this great humanitarian act, it turned out that it really exploded in our faces towards the end. Uh, and like I said, officially the hostilities ended in 1902, but they went on and on and even, even to this day, my wife has friends that are Filipinos, uh, they do not go to the island of Mindanao. Mindanao is not a place you want to go vacation. It is not Club Med. Uh, they are still, there are still problems with those people over there, similar to what we're having now. But the American Army, getting back to uh, the Spanish American War itself, the American Army uh, stumbled through this. And it was a very important, it was a very important time for the Army because some historians actually rate the Spanish-American War as the second most important event in American history, second only to the American Revolution. They say the American Revolution formed the country. The Spanish-American War basically put us in, in the situation of being a, what I say, a, on our way to being a world power. If it really wasn't for the Spanish-American War, at the onset of World War II, we wouldn't have had troops in the Philippines. And by the way, the Philippines became a military liability. It did not turn into the hub of oriental trade. It turned out to be nothing more than, uh, than a thorn on our side. We, we got Guam out of the deal. We got the Philippine Islands and the archipelago of small islands. We annexed Hawaii. We ended up with Puerto Rico, which is still now a, a commonwealth. Uh, and, and Cuba was given free, its freedom. So the spanish American War was really the proving ground for what was to come. And if it wasn't for the spanish American War, I really don't know how well equipped the United States Army would have been when we went into World War I. Because the spanish American War showed the shortcomings of a lot of American equipment and tactics and everything else. As we all know, the Spanish were, as far as military-wise, was considered was cutting edge. They used German Krupp artillery, Maxim machine guns. They had already adopted the Spanish Mauser Model 93, which actually was a variation of the Turkish Mauser, which they actually copied. Their uniforms were adapted to the climatic conditions they were in. And they had been there for already a few hundred years. So they already knew how to deal with uh, the environment and the people. The United States soldiers, first, this was the first large invasion of the United States troops. D-Day, or Deportation Day, on, in, on, in June was the first time a large amount of U.S. soldiers were going to leave the U.S. soil. And when they started putting these guys, when they started putting these units together, they found the shortcomings. And that's where we're going to talk about the equipment at all. Uh, and if, if anybody has any questions, I prefer just like we can wait for the end and then we can just file the questions out. But um, the United States Army going into the Spanish-American War didn't really look much different from the soldiers that fought in the Civil War. 
The standards uniform still, by the time of the Spanish American War, was a very, very heavy wool blouse. Model 1884. Uh, this was it. This is the blouse. Okay? Uh, this is really designed more for cool climatic conditions up in Montana and places like this. Really not the uniform for running around in subtropical conditions such as Cuba. Now, the Army did have the hindsight to realize that the, the heavy wool blouse was not going to be needed over there in the Philippines and or in Cuba. So they, they allowed the men to uh, basically wear the campaign shirt or fighting what was called shirt sleeves, which it was just a really heavy navy blue woolen flannel shirt. Still not the best uh, garment to be wearing in uh, subtropical climatic conditions such as Cuba, Puerto Rico. But these shirts are very, very heavy. Uh, and they are made of wool. And this is the Model 1882 shirt. This is the shirt that was still used all the way up to the adoption of the OD green or the khaki pullover shirt. This is basically the World War I shirt in navy blue. Uh, the, as we get down to the you know, transition to the the service uniform for the soldiers in the, in the 1890s was still the blue wool service uniform. Very heavy wool pants. These are the uh, same model, uh, 1884 trousers, belted back, braces, they, they weigh probably close to a pound. Now, what were the Spanish wearing? Well, the Spanish were wearing what would almost be uh, uh, like into like pajamas. They wore a very, very thin cotton, light gray with a very fine blue stripe material. I always have trouble pronouncing it. Uh, you may be able to say it easier than me. Redel, Redel, Redel. It was it was a, a very thin cotton uh, uniform, and they didn't wear shoes. They wore sandals. Americans went in wearing. A, very heavy blue wool uniform, <coughs> such as this. Um, they were probably miserable. The soldiers were. If you see so, so photographs of these guys, they look miserable. The army had realized that they had to do something, and they, right as the war, as war was being declared and the troops were being mobilized, they were already looking at a better uniform for men. But unfortunately, most of those uniforms did not reach the men until after active combat in most of the hostilities in Cuba were over. Now, everybody's heard of the Rough Riders. Okay, you probably saw that movie that came out a few years ago. Right? Um, the Rough Riders, they, they always portrayed the Rough Riders as wearing the khaki uniform. They were not actually wearing the, the government khaki uniform. They were wearing what was called the brown stable dress. It was a, actually it was a chocolate brown uh, canvas uniform. My understanding is, is it didn't breathe or do much better for you than the wool uniforms. It wasn't really designed for that. They wore a brown, uh, it was a brown stable dress uniform, and the dye that they used to dye this uniform, they said, would make you sick. Whatever it was, it was a putrid smelling cloth. Uh, it was actually like a cocoa color brown. Uh, most of the pictures of these soldiers, Spanish princes, is after the war, so you don't have to see them in their khakis. Most of these guys did not have khaki uniforms. Uh, khaki was being worn by some of the officers, but not by the enlisted. Most of the enlisted men in Spanish American War, you're going to be seeing them wearing the 83 shirt, the, the, um, the 84 trousers, and the brown lights. This predominantly made the, the service uniform for men. By, by, by the end of June, going into July, the khaki uniforms were just starting to be issued out to the men in drips and drips. And at first, really, what they did was is they adopted the uniform that was being used by the British soldiers that were fighting in the Second Boer War. And there's actually a lot of evidence to suggest that some of the uniforms that the United States, the United States soldiers were wearing are actually British uniforms. They purchased some of the British uniforms to get them in because the United States had a trouble, had problems producing the correct khaki cloth. What they ended up making was like a brown canvas. They couldn't really make the true khaki uniform that the British were making. They ended up making a light cotton canvas uniform. Probably a little bit better off. Like I said, it's known for not, it, it, it was known for not breathing very well and not really being much better off than the blue one. But the first service uniforms that these men received were these 
khaki or a big ball of khaki mm -hmm. under your coat. These cottons real uniforms such as this. And this is the first pattern. This is, this is now the beginning of the United States Army sort of transitionalizing to something a little bit more modern. Uh, this is the first pattern uniform that was issued out. This is pretty faded out. It's just, uh, it's, they, 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 these things don't really hold up all that well. But they were all, they were all dressed out with branch of service colors on pockets and cuffs and all that, which was done unofficially by the manufacturers. Uh, they were all supposed to have it on the shoulder straps and collars, but they decided to, to some of these manufacturers trick these jackets out pretty fancy. The Army didn't really like that, and by by 1899, they had modified the uniform to look more like this. And like I said, by 1899, the hostility with Cuba was over. In 10 weeks, the war, the battle, the fighting with, with the Cubans, the, the uh, Spanish and Cuba was over in 10 weeks. What was left was occupation and what was going on in the Philippines. So the United States soldiers starting in 1899, the old blue service uniform was pretty much gone, and they were now wearing what we would call a khaki field service uniform. Now, the blue uniform was reserved for dress and back in skates, but in the field, this is what you could wear. Now, along with, along with the khaki service uniform, headgear change had evolved. They went from a, uh, they went from a, a dark blue or almost a black blue campaign in the 1880s into a drab campaign. And, and this became really the trademark of the soldiers in the Spanish American War, the old drab campaign hat, which just later evolved into the 1911 the Montana Peacock. But this was the original pattern, khaki uh, campaign hats that were issued to the men. They did not hold up very well. They were, they were fairly cheap. And once they got rained on a couple of times, they lost their shape. And they literally kind of just kind of like fell apart. Uh, but even the hat transitioned a little bit later, a little bit better ventilation on the hats. By 1899, they were putting vents in the side of the hats to alleviate some of the uh, uh, the heat that these hats were keeping in. And they even tried cork helmets. Now this is a model 1899 helmet. It's not the first of the pattern cork helmets that United States soldiers used. There's an earlier model in 1880, had a little bit of shorter back. But by 1899 they tried to reintroduce these along with the cap uniform. And if you put this uniform together, it looks very, very, very similar to the uniform that was being worn by the British soldiers in the, in the Second Boer War. Um, we were leaning a little bit towards that. We were taking notes from other countries that were fighting. So these were not very popular. You'll see officers wearing them. Very rarely you'll see enlisted men wearing them. Enlisted men prefer to wear the, 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 the drab or the slouch hat uh, for protection. Uh, in barracks, you can wear what's called the address cap or the 95 full box hat. This replaced the model 1872 uh, cap. So this was the last of the small rising peak caps. This was very seldom ever worn in the field. This was more of a behind the lines or a barracks. Although the Marine Corps did wear a silver hat, but this, this was their hat for when they were, uh, you know, part of their field uniform uh, with a white cover. Uh, the United States Army was strictly reserved more for in the rear for dress purposes. Um, equipment wise, this is where it gets a little, a, a little strange. Uh, actually, it's strange, but this is where we're going to show our, our in, in adaptability. Um, packs such as this Miriam pack were designed for the soldiers in early. They very rarely, very few of these were ever actually carried during the Spanish American War. They were just not really, they weren't really used much. Uh, I just have, because it is of the era, there are some soldiers wearing them, but there's no, I haven't seen any photographic evidence of these being used over in, in Cuba or any place. So they probably uh, abandoned these on the boats. Um, they were they were quite ingenious the way they were put together. Uh, the two sides, two side poles, when they last together, served as your shelter tent pole, and they were only designed to carry the official load, including a blanket and a poncho inside. So whatever you were issued would fit in them, and that's about all. Uh, they tended not to be very comfortable for wear. You needed to have the cartridge belt on to wear these. Very similar to the 1910 and 19. Uh, uh, 12 and 28 pack, they hooked to the cartridge belt. So without the cartridge belt, you couldn't wear the backpack. Uh, most of the soldiers in the Spanish American War carried what belongings they had in horseshoe hole. Poncho or a shelter tent, which was rarely ever put up. They would just roll their belongings in it, roll it up, bring it together, tie it off. Very similar or reminiscent to the way that some of the Confederate soldiers carried their equipment during the Civil War. You see a lot of soldiers in Cuba carrying the stuff that. 
uh, a wool blanket such as this was issued out to the men. Uh, mess kits. Uh, the 1870 was the beginning of the Army actually issuing out the mess kits and things, which we refer to as a meat camp. Uh, this could be used to basically store your meat ration in, and then you could use as a plate and as a fry pan. This is the model 1874, but there was a shortage in a lot of this equipment. So this is what was called an emergency issue mess kit. These were manufactured outside of government uh, workshops and arsenals. Uh, you'll see some of these used by the men. Uh, these were not government issued, but the government had to go outside the box. And they had to buy a lot of sub some substandard equipment to give to these men because there was not enough. When you have a 28,000 man army, you don't have a lot. And I, I forgot, I don't know what the exact numbers with the ranks swelled to, but they found that a lot of the National, National Guard troops were improperly equipped also. A lot of them were missing, you know, elements of the uniform, mess kits, blankets, leggings. The, the government, they had to pool their resources and they had to supply uh, to a lot of these men the things that they needed to get them out. What a lot of people don't realize is the majority of fighting during the Spanish American War was done by the regular army. Very few volunteer or National Guard troops got involved in any combat initially in Cuba. They were used extensively and heavily in the Philippines. But there was very few National Guard troops or volunteer troops that actually got into the fight in Cuba. Um, I think the seventh of New York was one that got into some combat. Of course, the first volunteer cavalry, the Rough Riders. There was a couple other units, but most of the volunteer units, the state units, didn't make it over to Cuba in time for the initial fight. Uh, but they were heavily used, and a lot of them went over to the Philippines. Um, canteens, still the old Civil War style, oblique. This is the model 1878 canteen. Um, standard, standard canteen cover with wool and then with a canvas cover. You have a leather strap, such as this. Now there's a canteen strap. This is a haversack strap, but a lot of the soldiers by this time like to use the haversack straps because they were a little bit wider. The canteen strap was very narrow. It tended to cut into the shoulders. So a lot of soldiers used the same strap for both. Um, your food or your rations were carried in one of those days what was called a haversack. Now, for collectors, people, you see these out a lot. There's these two styles of haversacks you see. This is actually the Spanish American War haversack. This is model 1878. This is a model 1899. This was the, this was the outcrop of this. The soldiers, the, the, in the regular army, most of the troops going into the Spanish War carried their smaller model 1878 haversack. These are seen a little bit later on, 1899 and later. They increased the size of And in this bag, you were supposed to carry your mess kit goes in here, there's spots for your knife, fork, and spoon, and then there's a meat ration bag that sticks right into the back. This would be swung off of a strap on your left side. This would carry your hard bread and your meats and things like that. And th these, these are what you're supposed to carry food ration in. Anything else your personal belongings had to carry in a knapsack, or in this case, what they have is called a blanket bag. And it really is nothing more than a very large version of a haversack. And this is where you can put your bedding, extra socks, your shirt, your toiletries. These items would have been carried in this. And this was probably the more popular of the means of carrying your, uh, you know, your, your, your necessities outside of your food. Uh, these were used as late as almost World War I. Um, they are, they're, they're just a big single bag. And on the back here is a little strap so that you can hang your cup off of when you're on the march. And utensils were tinned iron, tin ironware, typical. But like I said, this time the Army was standardizing the equipment. And other than your bedding, which consisted of a blanket and a poncho and a, half a, ground, a, a, a shelter tent, uh, your haversack and your mess kit, what you see here on the table is pretty much all the Army issued you. That's it. That's all the soldiers had to carry. Uh, change of clothing probably constituted a pair of long drawers, a shirt, and a pair of socks. All that would fit into the blanket. They didn't carry a lot. Everything, you know, it, 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 mobility was important <coughs> even in those days. So there's not a lot of items. And if you look at these items here, these, were, these items were pretty much in play up through the late 1890s, early 1900s. And of course, equipment switched over around 1910. 
luckily before World War One, they, they started to upgrade and modernize the equipment. But the standard equipment here for the soldiers was pretty much not different from the 1870s. Um, getting it to the weapons, which is what we're all really interested in, and I'm going to spend more time with this stuff than anything, this is where we were really lacking. Most all of the volunteer units were armed with the standard single shot 45 70 rifle. Now, some of them had the later models, the 88s, which are still the 84s, 45 70 single shot rifle, black powder. Uh, the Spanish had a similar thing, had a similar circumstance over in Cuba. Their volunteer troops were armed with a similar rifle. I'm going to talk about that at the end. But the majority of the U.S. troops that went over to Cuba were armed with the tractor of Springfield when they got there. Because the Army, which was only 28,000 men, were armed with the more modern weapons. And the more modern weapon at the time for the United States Army was the Crack Jordan's rifle, which we're all pretty much familiar with. We, we beat this like a dead horse. Uh, this is a Model 1898. It was made in 1899, so it's one of the first Model 98s. 98 rifles were not used in the Spanish American War. Most of these ended up in the Philippines. The guns that were used in the Spanish American War were your 92s that were converted and your 96 rifles. The 98 rifles, although it says Model of 1898, most of these were not produced until 1899. So uh, there's, it's just a variation in the operation of the magazine cutoff and bolt, and things like that. Otherwise, they still operate the same. They were 30 caliber, they were center fire, they were smokeless powder. But they utilized a loading gate on the side of the weapon, which facilitated problems in loading the weapon. Whereas the Spanish were using the Mauser rifle, the 90, they call the 93, which used a charger or a stripper clip. The United States soldiers were still obligated to be using the old Mills belts, such as this, 50 round for the 45 caliber rifle, 100 round for the 30 caliber rifle. And you had to pull out individually five loose cartridges, drop them into the loading gate, close the loading gate, and operate the pole. Um, being a single locking lug bolt also, they says that the Krag rifle couldn't develop the high enough reach pressures to develop a higher velocity bolt. Uh, it's a very smooth bolt action gun, but it fell out of favor quite quickly after the Spanish American War, especially when they got to compare the two. Um, the Krag carbon, such as this, this would be the last of the carbons that the Army would make, because the next model gun to come out would be your model 1903 Springfield rifle, it falls lengthwise between the carbine and the rifle. So the 03 became the all-in-one rifle. You can use it for cavalry, you can use it for the infantry, whereas during this era here, the cavalry and maybe artillery would have been issued to carbines, and the infantry would have been issued to the long rifle. And this is the model 99, this is the last of the carbines that were produced uh, for, the, for the government, uh, but it, it operates the same way. Yeah, you needed a Mills belt to operate the gun. The Navy, on the other hand, they went a totally different direction. They had adopted a small bore, six millimeter straight pole weapon developed by James Paris Lee. The six millimeter Lee was this was predominantly a, a Navy weapon. It was used by the Marine Corps. It was, it was uh, available on capital Navy ships. They did not use the Krag Jorgensen rifle until 1899. This gun was in service from 1895 to 1900. They were pulled out of service. Then the Navy got on board with the United States Army, and the Navy was using a 30-40 Krag, and the Army was the first time in a number of years where the Navy and the Army were on board with the same weapon. Because the Navy had theirs, and the Army had theirs. Uh, but this, this rifle here, although innovative, was problematic. Uh, the small caliber, small bore was, was, was a nice idea, but the cordite powder that was utilized and the Medford rifling that was in this gun, it was a recipe for disaster. Also, there was a lot of small operating parts within the bolt. The extractors tended to be weak. So the guns were very problematic. They worked great at a range or, you know, you know, where, you know mainland here, but in the field, they became very problematic. And they were withdrawn out of service by 1900. Um, uh, 
the handguns or the revolvers used was pretty much, and this is a this is a this is a this is a later model. Uh, this is a model 1903, but it's pretty much the same as the model 92. 30 ca 38 caliber uh, service revolver. The only difference between the 92 and the 03 was the addition of the lanyard ring here, and uh, they thinned out the um, they thinned out the, uh, the the grip. And there was a change with the the Colt long, or I think it's the bore diameter, right? Well, the bore yeah, diameter. Yeah, the bore diameter from 375 to 357. Yeah. But it's pretty much the same gun. Uh, once again. Mills belt for the ammunition holsters. Now, uh, keep in mind, like this, this set is actually pretty much all dates at the same time. Spanish American War leather goods are black. If anybody is trying to pawn, like this, this, this revolver holster here is for this gun, but it has to date from after probably 1903 or so because it is in brown buff. Spanish American War leather goods were all black. So if this was a Spanish American War era holster, it would have been black. You also have little small 38 caliber cartridge boxes that you see. They're usually brown. They're mostly dated 0304. They're post. That same box is very hard to find in black. That would have been a Spanish American War pistol box for the 38 revolver. Um, the Spanish, uh, and I, I, there's a couple of Spanish uh, um, 93s here. I don't have them. But the Spain uh, had adopted also and it's the only Spanish weapon I have, uh, a rolling block, uh, the rolling block rifle. Uh, the first models of these were purchased through uh, Remington directly, the 1870 model. There was two contracts for the 1870 model. This is a 75. Uh, there's a first and second contract, 1870, and then there's a model, 1875. These were purchased from the United States. This is what their, the regular army rifle in Spain was until the adoption of the model 93. Uh, it's a nice weapon, it's, it's, if you're familiar with the rolling blocks, a very sturdy, strong breech mechanism. Operates almost the same principle as our single shot tractor. These were in the hands of most of the colonial and volunteer troops, Spanish troops, in Cuba. Just like our National Guardsmen were armed with the tractor and the regular army was armed with the crack, it was the same with the Spanish army. Spanish regulars, most of Spanish regulars were armed with a 93 Mauser. Their colonial troops and their volunteers and their, I guess there was even some Cubans that were involved in the Spanish army for whatever reason, they were armed with this weapon which was considered to have been inferior at the time. It was black powder, it was in 43 caliber. And there are two, a lot of people don't realize this, there's two versions of this gun. There's the American version, which is made by Remington, which uses the 43 Spanish. Spain later bought the patent rights to produce these in the Aviado arsenal. When they produced the weapon, they used a new cartridge that was designed by one of their military officers. And it is the, it's the 43 Reformado. It's the brass colored bullet. It will not chamber into this gun. The 43 Remington round that goes in this will go into the Aviado, but the Aviado round will not chamber into this gun. This gun is a slight bottleneck, whereas the Aviado cartridge or the Reformado, they call it the poisoned bullet, because they say that being brass and in a leather cartridge box, a verticus would grow onto the bullet, and when the soldiers would get hit with this, the verticus would cause a blood poisoning. I don't think there's really any, any, any truth to any of that, because I think once you fire the, the round down the rifling of this gun, I, I think it would cook off anything that was on there. Um, the, the Aviado round is a tapered brass colored bullet. And sometimes I've seen people uh, trying to jam these in those guns, and they only go in about that far. But it's, it's a, it, this, this, these bullets are a, a bottleneck. Uh, I've never had an opportunity to fire this gun. Uh, but I'm quite sure it probably uh, standard fired yours. No. Is that ever fired one of these? Yeah, rolling blocks? How do they, yeah, how do they fire them? The well, rolling block is pretty much the same. About a five or six inch group at 100 yards. And Not bad gun, but they're, they're black the powder. The is fairly substantial. Yeah, they're black powder. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, uh, if anybody has any specific questions, I try to keep this really kind of short because I know some people kind of lose interest uh, 
you know, long presentations. But if you have any questions, now would be the time. Anything I didn't cover or didn't cover enough? Go ahead, uh, Angus. All the 4570s were black powder. Yes. And uh, the uh, black powder the, says wherever you are. Yeah. So they, here they, they are. They did come up with, for those of you who collect cartridges, if you ever come across a 4570 cartridge that has a knurled cantalure almost to the center of it, they are specially made cartridges that were done during the Spanish-American War. They were a reduced black powder cartridge to try to cut down on the smoke. So if you, if you ever find them, most of your Spanish-American War cartridges, the militaries, are tinned. They're silver tinned. You will find brass ones that have a knurled, very narrow knurled candelure around the center of them. They are reduced, smokeless, they're reduced black powder cartridge. Not, not, in, not in, um, in, in, in charge, but to reduce the smoke. Um, they're mostly made by uh, Union, uh, Union Metallic Cartridge Company who made them. They're kind of hard to find anymore. At one time there was a lot of them out there. But they were, they were, you know, they, they said these things kicked like a mule, these 45 70s, but they gave away the positions. Uh, I, I don't know what the battle was, but one of the, one of the infantry regiments that was armed with the 45 70s put a salvo out, and the Spanish just, they just homed in on where the smoke was, and they, they poured it in on these guys. And the regular army troops didn't want to be around these guys, so as soon as they started firing, they just give their positions away. And the 71st New York was all armed with like, the trapdoor Model 88 Ramrod Bay. That might have been the unit. It might have been the Battle of Las Cosimas. They, they opened up with their 4570s, and the, the Spanish artillery just said, oh, well, there they are. And they just got the range, and they just, they just dumped it in on them. Um, it really was, the, the war was really, when the Spanish soldiers' heart really wasn't in the fighting there. I mean, the, the, the invasion, the United States invasion onto the island was, 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 wasn't even, uh, um, wasn't even, um, um, they didn't even try to stop it. They said that it, had the Spanish tried to oppose the landing, they probably would have wiped out the entire well, landing. Well, what happened was the Cuban army stopped the Spanish in the road. The Americans came in because the horses went out to sea. Yeah, they, they, yeah. It, they yeah. horses that went out to sea. Yeah, these are little, these are little things that people don't realize. When they loaded the ships, when they, they the, 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 whole, the whole invasion started off really bad. When you load a ship, the thing that you need first, you need to put in last, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't do that. They were worried about forgetting something. So the Army, when they loaded these transports, they put the important stuff in first. So when they got out to sea, they couldn't get to nothing. They loaded the heavy artillery and the horses on, and do on docks. Well, the, naval, the Navy landing didn't come in to land on docks, <laughs> all right? They, they had all these horses for the cavalry, so what did they do with them? They pushed them overboard. Guess what? They wow. swam out to sea. They didn't swim inland. It wasn't until a cavalry trumpeter got smart and got into a boat and started to blow recall that some of the horses turned around and swam inland. <laughs> Most of the horses swam out to sea. The large, the large artillery pieces that they loaded on wharfs they had no way to get them into a rowboat. They couldn't put these things in a row. They landed these soldiers in rowboats all night long, the Navy rowing these guys back and forth. They said if, if one or two companies of Spanish soldiers sat on the boat on the beachhead and waited for the Americans to come in, they could have, they could have slaughtered them in the water before they even got there. But they actually let them, they let them come in and land. They landed in a daiquiri. A daiquiri. Yep. And there was a Cuban guerrilla that held the rope. The Spanish were coming, there was a Spanish regiment coming up, and they held them to the Americans, and it took like a week. Yeah, it was, it was a mess. Went. It was a mess. So we also had a question that was over here. What? Who manufactured the pistols that you showed us? That's a Colt. Most of them, I believe, when those days stand, most of them are all Colt. Colt. Colt, Revol Colt 38 Colt the new Army. Army. Yeah. Colt 38 Colt. Questions? You know, they talk about the San Juan Hill Charge. Well, no, horses in some no, they were on foot. And, on and, 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 and also, Theodore Roosevelt did not go up no, he San Juan Hill. <laughs> he went up Kettle. Kettle Jack Pershing went up San Juan Hill. Okay. But, you know, it, San Juan Hill sounds better than Kettle Hill. So <laughs> when it got back into the newspapers, although I should say that the, the initial assault up San Juan Heights, San Juan Hill, was done by the regular arm. Roosevelt and the Rough Riders went up Kettle. When they, when they secured Kettle Hill, 
They did adjoin the assault. So, yeah, did he go up San Juan Hill? Yeah, he did. But really, it was Jack Pershing that was leading the regular yeah, army up San Juan Hill. That, 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 that really fought the bulk of the battle. You're going to have to stop there. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah, I don't know. I learned stuff too. I have to do some reading. with sailors walking around all, all day long. Did they do it? Yes. It, the, time, the time frame was that they had to be able to raise the temperature within so many hours to this combustible. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. Even still, so they debunked it. They debunked it.